Welcome to this video in which we present an overview of two-dimensional free body diagram interactions. The idea here is to go over the uh, several different ways in which the environment can interact with a body in a free body diagram and talk briefly about the types of things you might expect um, in terms of uh, forces and couples and uh, directions and so on. The idea is that this will hopefully, uh, by the time we're done with this, hopefully you'll be able to look at a particular situation and determine what sorts of forces or couples you need to have to represent the interaction of the environment and the free body diagram, or, or the free body in your free body diagram. So let's begin. First um, would be uh, what we might call rollers or frictionless a frictionless surface. Uh, so the idea might be that you have the body of interest and it's supported on rollers or perhaps your body of interest is on a frictionless surface. So for example uh, ice is pretty close to frictionless under certain circumstances. So you might have, well, well for example, if you're the uh, Egyptians building the pyramids, you would have taken large blocks of stone and put them on rollers in order to uh, reduce the friction between the ground and your stone. If you were the Egyptians during an ice age, which I don't know that ever happened, you might have been able to slide your uh, large blocks of stone on ice. So anyway, if you have a uh, situation like this where you have essentially a frictionless surface or some method like rollers to reduce friction, then the only force that you'll get applied to your body is a force that's normal to the surface, in other words, perpendicular to the surface. And the only unknown in this force will be the magnitude, because you already know its direction, which is normal to the surface. OK, so that's rollers or a frictionless surface. Um, another situation that you see often is cables or wires or strings or ropes, uh, things like that that are flexible but that you can use to exert a force on an object. So as an example of this, if you're an Egyptian, uh, you might have had uh, large blocks of stone and you used ropes uh, tied to willing uh, citizens who uh, applied forces to those stones. If you have a cable or some other type of, of uh, situation like this, uh, basically, you know that the force will be in the same direction or the same line of action as your cable. Uh, that's because cables are flexible and there's, if you try to get a force or exert a force on your object in some direction other than the direction that the cable's going, it just doesn't work. The cable bends. So the unknowns here, again, are just magnitude. Okay. Let's look at a pin joint. This is actually pretty much any any time you have um, I don't know, say an object and it's connected by a pin or more generally by some sort of bearing to a surface. And the idea is that this object can now rotate about the pin. Um, then um, this would be a pin joint, uh, or more generally a bearing. But I don't know, for some reason, uh, uh, people that do dynamics are hung up on pins. So if I look at my object that I'm doing the free body diagram on, in this case, my pin can exert forces in both the x and y direction, 
but it won't uh, exert any couple. It won't cause any rotation. And that's again because uh, being a pin or a bearing, uh, this, uh, does, this allows free rotation. It doesn't cause rotation one direction or the other. So quite often you'll see these forces drawn as, uh, say, x and y components. Sometimes you'll see them drawn as a single vector where you assume that both the magnitude and the direction of the vector are unknown. So the unknowns here are magnitude and direction or equivalently sometimes you'll just see uh, the x and y components. Okay. Another case that you get essentially the same thing happening in terms of what the uh, free body diagram looks like with some caveats is if I have a surface with friction. Okay, so now I've got my gigantic stone. It's resting on the ground, and the ground is not frictionless. Um, so uh, in this case, it takes a lot more uh, willing subjects to move the thing than it did if you've got rollers under it. Okay, again, if you have a surface with friction, then in your free body diagram, you'll have a force. Uh, well, you'll have both components, uh, horizontal and vertical components of the force, which again, you can represent in a single vector if you want to, although with friction, it tends to not be very useful to do that. Um, the thing that is different between a surface with friction and a pin joint is that there are um, some restrictions on the horizontal component in the sense that the magnitude, the maximum magnitude of this horizontal component depends on a coefficient of friction and on the magnitude of the vertical component. And um, the way it typically works is if, uh, well, that, that coefficient of friction and the vertical component give you the maximum value of your horizontal component. And so if the actual force when you're doing an analysis exceeds this um, horizontal component, then you might have an object start to slide or something like that. Okay, one last um, situation is where you have a rigid joint or a rigid connection or I've seen this also called a fixed support. So the idea here is perhaps you have a, a bar of iron and it's been welded to some uh, metal substrate. Or another one might be you've got a post that's buried in concrete or something like this. But it's a rigid connection such that um, the rectangle that I've drawn here doesn't move. Uh, you can push on it up here, uh, down here, wherever you want to push on it, and it doesn't move. Okay, the situation in this case then is that you will have a horizontal and a vertical component to the force, but now because you've got a rigid connection, and say for example I can actually, I, I can push up here against the top of the rectangle, um, my connection will also exert a couple to, for example, counter the force that you put up here. Okay, so in this case, the unknowns are the magnitude and direction, or the x and y components, plus 
the magnitude of the couple. Okay, so the idea here again is that um, if you have a rigid connection, you'll have an X and a Y component of a force. And again, if you want to, you can represent this as a single vector with an unknown magnitude and an unknown direction. But then you'll also have a couple. So this pretty much concludes this video. The, again, the objective was to indicate uh, different conditions that show up in the analysis of uh, mechanics problems and to try to help you understand how to handle those when you're putting together a, uh, a free body diagram. So hopefully this has been helpful.